I have a, a paired question that I would like to put to whoever would care to answer it. What lessons can Houston learn from other cities where you've worked, and what can other cities learn from Houston when it comes to landscape architecture and green space policy and practices? Have at it. Okay, I'll, I'll dive in. Why not? I always do. Um, you know, I mean, the, the cool thing about Houston is uh, I think the scale of projects that we get to do here. I mean, we do get to take giant things and recreate them, right? Uh, and we take things that, are, that exist in a certain framework that everyone maybe passes by it every day and thinks that that's just the way it is, right? So a concrete line by you, right? That's just what it is. Um, but we take it and we re-envision it as a, you know, a way to save homes from flooding. And then we start to put trails in it and we start to then think maybe there should be nature as a part of it. So these things build, right, and create this alternative reality of what I guess people always thought it should be. And I think when you go to other cities, um, Maybe a lot of it, you know, a lot of the cities that people think about as design cities are kind of antique cities, right? Boston, maybe New York, uh, San Francisco. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, you're, those projects are smaller there. They seem that way to me anyway. And I think that there are opportunities in those cities because they do have big infrastructures. They do have big systems that they could embrace. Um, and I think that's, that's a difference is just maybe the scale and the ambition um, because it's a new city. Um, I can add to that because we work in so many cities that want a discovery green. You know, every city wants a discovery green. And I think the thing that we try to impress upon people is that uh, in investment in these kinds of public realm projects can be catalytic and can be can result in hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of private investment. Uh, in turn. So I think that's something cities are learning from Houston uh, right and left. Um, and, and then likewise, I would say I hope the, the lesson comes that creating just landscapes has value. Uh, you don't have to just create destinations, but creating landscapes has value. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I agree. The, you know, Houston is the poster child of all that's wrong with you know post-war development and, and and a lot of what we do here is a reaction to that extreme reaction um, but the, the like, like you were saying the economic value that comes behind uh, that work has really played out in an, an amazing transformation in a very short period of time um, and and I think as a, as a lesson for other cities certainly you know this whole notion of leading with landscape has a has a very direct correlation to a, a very strong business model Houston's a competition for uh, expanding their economy diversifying their economy trying to get the best and the brightest just like every city and on every one of our projects small or large um, you know, developers are really honing in on the lifestyle changes that are taking place in the city and how that's marketable and ultimately um, helps them and and you know, build the city and build the image of the city uh, for their their personal growth and then ultimately for the unified growth of the city. Uh, uh, one of the things that um, places like Bryant Park started, Central Park Conservancy, and then kind of spread out all over the whole country is uh, a, a real uh, demand for uh, horticulture, for a kind of a fabulous level of horticulture. And this is, um, this has been great for us, um, but it also creates an incredible challenge because there's a, there's a level of beauty and a level of cleanliness and there's a level of care and there's a level, level of artistry, you know, that is just, I think it has been illustrated, uh, I think by a lot of our uh, projects that was shown here today. And this is, of course, is what's making us jobs. But it's also <coughs> setting up um, challenges that I think the client group that the city in general, the cities in general are getting their minds around, which is that you don't, we can't do what the previous great park builders did. Um, you know, uh, Moses, I think, added a thousand parks to New York City, um, but there was no plan of how to take care of them, right? And that was, you know, half good, you know? It was good that they were added. It's, it's, car, it's but a concept of a, of a park when I was a kid, the concept of Central Park was it was just a liability and we could get back there easily without the care and the infrastructural uh, for care 
that, that our parks need. So I think that is the really important lesson um, I'm getting, you know, in my, my life and my practice and looking at what's happening all around. And there's a there's a, a broad awakening to responsiveness to place. I think that's happening, you know, already an, an acknowledgement of the role that landscape can play to be, you know, a breathing space or a connective structure or you know that there's coloring in green on the map is in, in in itself good, but that the identity of a city could be reinforced and and created by actually responding to the culture of the city and to the ecology of the city and to the to the history of the city um, is is something that I think is gaining is gaining ground in in different ways in all of these different places that have these different histories and different identities um, so that instead of the kind of bland sameness uh, of the you know sort of an old model of thinking um, we're, we're going to see just this incredible you know revelation of of identity of a city through its landscape. I, I, I just add a key, uh, I think a key uh, element though to what Jeff was saying is that job was delegated to other people in the past. Mm -hmm. That was delegated um, when I was in graduate school. We have we ha we didn't have any landscape architecture to go visit. Okay, there was there wasn't there wasn't anything to go see unless you went out to some corporate campuses. Um, and then when uh, urban landscapes were starting to be made, we tried every. Uh, they tried everything. First, we well, landscape architects aren't creative enough. We need artists to lead this. We need artists to interpret our culture and our place and even our nature. They were even asking artists to do that. Um, uh, you know, and we need architects to do it because you know they're more professional or something. Uh, uh, <laughs> and and then we have gotten to a point here. Now this is a panel full of landscape architects talking about the city. This is, and not only as urban designers though, and not only as kind of quasi engineers, but also as artistic interpreters of the city, where our creative our creative um, insight into the city and nature and culture is now becoming a trusted co commodity and, and that is a very exciting thing. Well now it's your turn. Um, I might suggest if you want to ask a, a question, uh, if you would just please stand up and address it to our panel. Well, um, Absolutely, I, I hope we did that. I mean, I certainly saw Nancy Kinder's picture a few times and uh, and I was certainly referring to Nancy uh, in my presentation, but it goes further back than that because it, when you think about uh, I'm a hog and sort of her initial moves to creating open space in the city by giving so much land to the city. And then uh, you think about the Brown Foundation and the Brown family. Um, Maconda Brown was an early, you know, that was our client group, Nancy Kinder, Maconda Brown, um, and others who, so it really was the philanthropist who wanted to create something beautiful that made Discovery Green happen. Now it's true Bill White called them um, and he put Guy Hackstead on it, uh, but it really was the, the, and then Nancy beat the bushes and got the money uh, and went to every corporation and every, now I don't know that that's the best model nationally, but it is the Texas model, it is the Texas way, and it works in Texas. Um, I'm not sure we wanna rely on that to, yeah. to allow our public uh, foundations and institutions and agencies to become more and more impoverished and rely on philanthropy because with, when the price of oil goes down, suddenly it dries up. So I, I, you know, it's true, but I'm not sure it's a model for the rest of the country. I've attended many, many fundraising meetings in small and large uh, forums uh, between 1995 and as far forward as 2005 where people just smiled and nodded and really thought what we're doing in Herman Park is a really great idea. That's great. You, you keep going. It just never really translated into money until Nancy Kinder. She changed the way that people give money to parks in Houston. And I have a, a strong memory of seeing um, mm -hmm. Uh, in, in Chicago, you know, we, you can look at the, the donor wall of um, Millennium Park and see 125 names on that donor wall and 120 of them are families. And in Houston, it's, as my friend Chris Knapp said to me once, it was much more common for a long time for people to come to Houston, make their big pile of money, and then go build their house in Aspen. And they weren't really giving back, they weren't really reinvesting in the city in the way that we see now. So that philanthropy has come a very long way from that 
era of the 1920s and 30s with the leadership of the hogs and that sort of generation. It was a big generational skip to get to where we are now. It, it also, I mean, it's interesting to think too, just the history of it, that I think, you know, if you went back 200 years, philanthropy was probably about uh, building a big church, or if you went back, you know, 500 years, right? That's where, that's where you spent your money on a church. And then later, that kind of maybe became a museum, right, uh, more recently. Uh, and then, of course, in Houston, big buildings, right? But that wasn't really philanthropy, that was just industry. Um, but now it's parks, right? And that, I mean, it is interesting that this sort of transition has happened over the years, has changed. I don't know what would be next. We, what, uh, hopefully it stays at parks, right? We don't want it to move on. <laughs> Maintenance of parks would be the next one, yeah. But I mean, it is, it's interesting, because I mean, the church is like this edifice, right? You see this thing, you can't miss it. You know, there's someone's, you know, built it. But a park is, you know, it's, it's a little diffuse, right? It's not as obvious oftentimes that someone spent money to make that happen. And we, we have issues with that all the time with, you know, if you talk to the general public at a, at a, uh, at a meeting, you know, about a park, they, they just think that just happened, right? The money just sort of showed up from, I don't know, some taxes that people paid. But that's not true. Um, and I think the, just even educating people, I mean, it's a good start, Anne. You know, it's a, it, we need to educate people about where does this money come from and why are people investing in these parks today? It's, it's a big deal. Yeah, I think, I think that maybe perhaps the common thread there is that uh, a church is the center of a, a, a community and parks are now becoming a s yeah. the, the center of, of our community. And uh, I think, uh, you know, Discovery Green is obviously a phenomenal example of that because it was a, w you know, downtown had no heart, so to speak. We had bits and pieces here and there, but it, it just threw, you know, shot it over the roof. And I think um, Buffalo Bayou is perhaps a new ver version of that. Herman Park is was probably the, you know, the longest one maintaining that role. But um, yeah, so I think, you know, Houstonians had a, have a, they didn't really see the potential in investment in open space. And I think that is what maybe led to this reliance on philanthropy. We knew how to make money as a city, yeah. um, but we didn't really trust in ways or that were legible that we could see a, a viable outcome um, to, to steer our own tax dollars and so forth into that. And hopefully that now with these great projects, we're gonna see a, uh, an opportunity for a shift in that direction. So we were working on a downtown parks master plan in <coughs> Dallas. Um, Robert Deckard, the philanthropist and business leader, funded it. And I kept talking about 24-hour life and the pedestrianization of the city. And he said, Mary Margaret, stop talking about that. Talk about land value. And so I think the, the idea that it's good business yeah. is also yeah. um, helping to add to uh, the philanthropy of wanting to do something good. It's also good business. But going back to that notion of what the image of this, <laughs> this city is, I spend a lot of time in McGovern Centennial Gardens. Uh, I try to walk through the gardens at least four times a day. I try to go up the mound at least once a day and just listen to people. And um, it's really amazing to me how many people are at the top of the mound and they're turning to their friend and they're like, finally, finally, I can explain to people what Houston is like. I can show them this. Now we have this thing, <laughs> which you can't even describe. <laughs> but, um, but it really is wonderful how, uh, it, it, you know, we get a lot of, of tourist traffic because we're right next to the museums and we're across from a hospital and we get a lot of people stumbling into the gardens and they're just stopped. <laughs> so the power of that experience is changing the way that they feel they can talk about and show Houston as a greater. Well, they're out there making a fantastic record for you that you have no control over. You know, we have an Instagram feed that goes onto our website, and every three seconds, somebody's posting another fantastic picture of themselves or their child or, you know, the, the, the documentation of life being lived in the park. We don't even have to take it, you know, it's just, it's just coming together, and it's just a really beautiful thing to witness. I don't think we as an organization are terribly sophisticated yet. I'm very impressed with your website, Charles, <laughs> in terms of how to sort of take advantage of that. But I think that's going to be an aspect of working on the master plan for the next phase of Herman Park, hopefully not getting stuck in the program. I mean, we, that's, it, that, that's a good point. I mean, we, uh, 
you know, I, I, I go to Instagram, hashtag Buffalo Bayou Park, whatever projects we've worked on, mm -hmm. and I stick those in presentations that we do to clients, because it's, uh, you can then see people, you know, not the photograph that I take of the park or our photographers take, but you can see the ones that the people take doing their thing, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, g going beyond like what people are starting to expect and want in parks, uh, you know, there's an interesting thing that, that I've noticed in Houston, right? If you think about Houston, you think about the suburbs and this vast space out there, right? That we're not really talking about a lot today. Um, but, you know, if you went back probably 20 years or even just, yeah, say 20 years ago, and you asked people in the suburbs, what do you want in your suburban community? The number one thing that always came up was trails, right? That's what the developers heard, we want trails. And I don't know if it was a lack of creativity or if it was just that that's what people wanted, but developers built trails like crazy. Um, and now you fast forward to today, what's the city city's building? They're building trails, right? And a lot of that in Houston, according to Dr. Kleinberg, people are moving from the suburbs to the cities, right, in, in big numbers again. Uh, and so it's younger people that grew up in the suburbs and now they're moving downtown. They want urban living, but they still want to bring the suburbs with them, which sounds weird, right? And what they want is the trails. And I think that that's a bit of a reason why like this big bond measure passed that the uh, Parks Board put out a few years ago to build massive, well, what we're building what, 150 miles of trails, I guess, in, in Houston right now. And that's just the Bayou Greenways. There's other ones on top of that. Um, I think it has something to do with that kind of odd learning from suburban sprawl. Uh, and putting that some of that stuff into the city as well, um, and it's creating a richer, richer place. I think that speaks to the, the desperation for open space that Houstonians have, and the, and the crushing impacts of of the vehicular dominance. I mean, it is it is like humiliating experience to walk across some of the yes. to be a pedestrian in this in this environment. I used to, when I first came to Houston, I got stopped while I was walking to a convenience store to and middle of a Sunday afternoon asking if something was wrong. Like, you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And, are you, uh, okay? are you okay? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Did you need a run? right. And, and that, that's a, it's, uh, this whole, this whole humanization of the city. I mean, it starts with like, with the most basic of infrastructure, get people from their front door to a place they want to be without, w in a, in a way that that's, that's liberating and, and, you know, they can, feel fresh air or even if it's hot you know he, and it's like there's also this thing that you know the weather is this big obstacle and but the reality is that people go out and use these parks all through the in the heat and the worst in the rain you know so I, I, I don't buy any of that stuff um, so well, I, you know, I mean actually I mean that that's the other funny thing about Houston right is like you know we're uh, we're always at the top of the list fattest city in the country right uh, it, but you know those metrics are based on kind of odd things like how close is a um, uh, a health club to your house right how far is the grocery store it's, it's that kind of stuff it's not really the weight of Houstonians I don't I, have, I haven't weighed us, so I'm not sure. Well, you grew up here. You're skinny. Come on. Uh, but anyway, but uh, my, my point is that if you go to Herm, um, um, Memorial Park, right, what is the first thing that you're just taken by? This crush of humanity out jogging in August, you know, when it's 98 degrees and 100% humidity, right? And this is the fattest city in the country, right? All these people out doing stuff. They're moving. They're moving. You know, they're on bikes. They're running. Um, and that's, you know, that's just a, that's the reality. That's that weird thing that you have to really try to understand in Houston that, you know, it, it doesn't add up, but somehow it all works. But Charles, Sir. I think you raised a potential, sorry, I think you raised a potential issue, though, that is a really critical issue and an important issue for all of us to grapple with. And that's the expectation that parks, anyway, downtown parks, I think trails and infrastructure, a combination of infrastructure and landscape has a real future because we can't solve these infrastructural problems without also, if we're smart, creating landscape opportunities. But when you think about the, the downtown park, there's the expectation that these guys are, that these things are self revenue generating, self-supporting. That, that is a really terrible, horrible trend that mm. people are expecting parks mm -hmm. to support, completely economically support themselves by the revenue they can generate. That's, a, that's, a, that's dangerous because that's a really not the way parks should be. Yeah, I mean, one of the worst parts of that is that no one understands economics either, right? And, and so they come to public meetings and they think like, oh, we could stick a restaurant or a cafe and a popcorn stand in here and everything is going to be fine. We're <laughs> going to cover, you know, the 35 gardeners that we need. Um, <coughs> and 
And I've even spoken to restaurant people who don't understand how impossible it is to run a restaurant in a park. I mean, I'm very glad to hear that yours is doing well there, and that's, um, you know, the density around it and the fact that it's surrounded on all sides um, probably helps a lot with that. But it's 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 crazy. You're right. It's absolutely crazy to think that we're going to stick some things in a park and they're going to pay for its operation. And I don't know if any of, any of you the rest of you have done this, but I've put myself out on the line um, with Brooklyn Bridge Park for f years and years of planning um, in the public realm in, in New York City where people are, you know, opinionated um, <laughs> to say, you know, if we're going to take this piece of waterfront and we're going to make a park out of it, we got to save some of the waterfront, develop some of it, take the money from the development and make a nice park, uh, use, and make, keep the park nice. And, you know, you can still see controversy about that decision even though everyone, you know, there's now so many people in Brooklyn Bridge Park that you can barely walk through it. So um, it's, uh, <coughs> it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very tough subject and, and, you know, basic economics, I think basic <laughs> economics needs to be like a kind of requirement for coming to a public meeting. You have to read a book on, <laughs> on, on, ba well, on basic one. economics. I'll start. I'll just say that um, in my experience, you, you can affect a lot more change if you can convince the engineering department, planning department, and so forth, that they have, that they are, they are as direct a contributor to the success and outcome of the, of the park and uh, as the designer and team and the owner themselves, and, um, and, that, and that they are critical in defining that success. Uh, some of the sm biggest challenges we face on projects are seemingly small, like you say, like, you know, connectivity, um, gateways, you know, we, we, this, we have a profession that is at the mercy of our context. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I think just reaching out and, and, and getting those, those people to really uh, believe, and it sounds kind of, you know, simplistic, a little naive perhaps, but, um, but it's played out, uh, at least locally here in Houston. Um, <coughs> I think people, they are very excited to be a part of making, you know, being, making a, a great change in the city, and you have to bring them through that whole process of why it's such a big deal, and not, and not just a, um, not just an intersection, but it's a gateway to a community of, you know, thousands of people to change their lives. So put in those terms for them. And I mean, Mary Margaret, your park has just made downtown explode, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, right? I mean, we're, we're doing are just watching these projects come out of the ground uh, all around yeah, it, right? Amazing. And you know, in, in some ways, I, I mean, I, I, it's Houston, right? So I wonder, you know, is all that uh, happened because we don't have zoning? Because it probably would have been zoned, <laughs> you know, back in the 80s as commercial space, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but people came in and took advantage of that, there's a beautiful park here now, let's make it residential space. And they didn't have some land use control saying you can't do that. Sure, there's office and residential side by side. Yeah, and it, it works, <coughs> right? Hotel, right? Yeah, in a hotel, absolutely. And there's gonna be a lot more of it. On Buffalo Bayou, you know, Scott, your work there, you know, I mean, we keep seeing all these, um, higher density apartments um, being built that are taking advantage of this access to this park. Um, and so I, I think it's happening. Um, and you know, it's, but you know, in, in a Houston way, right? It's this free market thing. People like, oh, there's, there's something uh, expensive there. Someone spent $60 million on a park. I want some of that, so they're going to build, you know, something expensive next to it. Well, th um, thank you. Uh, I think today we have here in, in front, uh, before you, uh, uh, a collective landscape architecture vision of the future of Houston. So please let us salute you.